Okay, so welcome everybody <laughs> to the Music Meditation Club. You guys are super lucky because we got a really special guest speaker today. Fugitive from the law. <laughs> they call him HD Goswami. I think they call him HD because he helps you see life in high definition. So that's where it kind of comes from. Um, I don't even know where to begin with his statistics and his stats. I know back in the 70s and 80s, he was responsible for distributing millions of spiritual books all over South America, Central America, Italy, Greece, North America, all over the place. And there's a famous uh, American writer named Christopher Morley. He says, when you give somebody a book, you don't just give them ink, paper, and glue, but you give them a possibility to a whole new life. So literally, HD has been responsible for transforming so many people's lives throughout the years. He's also gotten a PhD in Harvard University, and he's spoken throughout all the different universities around North America, taught at UCLA. I know UCLA is kind of like the enemy school here, but uh, we're very honored to have HD here today. I think it's his first time speaking at USC, so it's a special event, and let's just all give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much, and, and thank you all. Sincerely, thank you for coming. Um, two of my brothers actually graduated from USC Law School, and, uh, and I grew up on USC football, but I did betray all that and go to UCLA for my undergraduate work. So anyway, thank you all for coming. I had a topic, I thought I, it's, it's a philosophical topic and uh, I hope it won't be too excruciating. What I'm gonna try to demonstrate to you, I'm gonna try to persuade you, uh, hopefully through reasonable arguments and evidence, that we live in a bi-dimensional universe. And that that's not a question of just faith or uh, it's not a religious perspective. Uh, it's simply the philosophical fact. And so, um, oh, is that better? I'm not avoiding you, I'm just trying to see. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I just have to close on. So, um, I'm going to use Aristotle's terminology here. Aristotle, the father of modern logic or Western logic. Um, Aristotle talked about his physics and his metaphysics. And meta in Greek means what is beyond <clears throat> or what is after. And until around 1600, Sorry for those of you who, for whom this is a rerun, because I was talking about some of this stuff outside, but um, up until around approximately, I mean, it didn't just happen when the clock struck 12 on December 31st in 1599, but around 1600, uh, or in the 1600s, there was a, a scientific revolution. It's called the Age of Reason. And without going into all the historical circumstances, basically, for a very long time, um, the church, a single church, had ruled Europe. Uh, certainly, you could say intellectually, religiously, and to some extent politically and economically, which was kind of one of the problems. But anyway, so, um, and then there started to be a pushback. And, 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 and the pushing back against this sort of where there's only one valid book on earth, which is the Bible. And I'm not denigrating the Bible, you know, it's a very interesting book, but the idea that that was the only book worth reading. And to be fair here, to be rigorous, um, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, and there really were some dark ages. I mean, I mean you, you take the Greco-Roman civilization, which was intellectually very sophisticated. It, it, would be, it would be 
very silly and ignorant to think that we are more intellectually sophisticated in that culture. In some ways, we're much less. I mean, we're more technically advanced, but in terms of philosophy and ideas and, and, and language, very sophisticated civilization, and then it, it, it collapsed and, and literacy itself almost vanished. So, so there really was a, a cataclysmic event. And Charlemagne, you know, honk if you like Charlemagne. Charlemagne started to reunite Europe and by reuniting Europe with the Holy Roman Empire, he started to get the resources necessary to reestablish a really interesting item, which is called culture. And so you have to, I want to give credit to Charlemagne. He started to recreate education, serious education. In fact, he kind of planted the seeds. It, he, he asked the abbeys, he asked the priests like, hey, you guys, you know, pe you're kind of in the center of these little market towns. Why don't you give a few classes? Maybe people can learn to read and write. And these little programs, these little schools turned into the first European universities. And so anyway, jumping ahead here, leaping to the high middle ages, you get someone like Thomas Aquinas who did something very radical. And he was considered to be radical. In fact, he was considered to be a problem by many of the leaders in Europe in his time. Now, the Summa Theologica, you know, the big thing he wrote, is like, that's very conservative. But in his time, he was a dangerous kind of radical. Because what he did was, he said that actually, there's some benefit in pagan philosophers. He kind of, as I say, baptized Aristotle. And that became Catholic doctrine. To give credit where credit's due, uh, the Renaissance, which is what we're leading up to here, uh, actually began in the Islamic world. They were much more advanced than Western Europe. I mean, Western Europe really was this endless Monty Python movie. If you've ever seen like dating myself here. Anyway, so it was, it was really, it was really the dark ages. And um, so, the, so Aquinas says that, that we can, actually understand God by applying certain rational techniques and categories that come from pagans. They're not even Christians, but they have some good ideas. And that was very radical back then. That was extremely controversial. To put things just in a little perspective, if you go back to the Greco-Roman world, which was much more like our world than the Middle Ages, the Greco-Roman world, if you read some of the authors, whether it's the journals of Julius Caesar in Gaul or anyway, other books, I mean, they're very, they talk like we do. They think like we do. They're very, they're rational. They're kind of, they're good historians or good journalists. So that world is much more like ours. And they were, and even in the, in the approach to religion, they were syncretistic. This goes all the way back to Alexander. Alexander had this one world program like, hey, we don't want religious fanaticism. We're all worshiping the same God. We use different names. Let's all get along and let's have a rational enlightenment. Because, you know, Aristotle's uh, Alexander's tutor was Aristotle. So, and, and the Romans totally bought into this. They totally bought into that, that, okay, we call gods by different names, but there's one divine power. That's why the Roman emperor used to make a donation every month to Jerusalem so that in the temple in Jerusalem, the, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, they would make an offering in the name of the emperor. And the emperor would make offerings to many other, you know, Egyptian mystery religions and so on, which are very popular. Because the idea was it's all one. It's all one divine power that manifests in different ways. And there's even a Latin name that or, or is Greek. It's called Prisca Theologica. Prisca Theologica, which used to be a really hot term that everyone knew. Uh, meant literally ancient philosophy, the idea that there, there actually is a spiritual truth in the universe. And, and that truth kind of comes into different cultures and different civilizations. And to some extent, not entirely, to some extent it gets filtered. And so it gets expressed in different ways, but behind all these cultural filters, there really is a single ultimate spiritual reality. And so, so when, and of course, Aquinas starts to get into Greek philosophy, which he, I mean, and of course, he was borrowing from the, the, the Islamic Renaissance, which started the whole ball rolling. 
And then you get into the early Renaissance, Descartes, Plutarch, uh, not Descartes, uh, Dante, um, Dante. And, 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 and the people that started the Renaissance, I mean, think of the word Renaissance, the French word, it means rebirth. What is it a rebirth of? It's a rebirth of pagan culture. So in the high, really just coming out of the high Middle Ages, when Europe, it's really, if you don't do what the church says, and if you don't at least outwardly agree with what the church says, you know, it can ruin your whole day because you could be burned alive. And this is what happened to some of the early Renaissance people. You know, some of the, it started in Florence. Some of the early Renaissance people were in fact burned alive, which is, you know, that's not a nice thing. And so, so it was very bold. And these, these are the people, the Renaissance people that said, talked about dark ages. What they were referring to as the dark ages is the period in history when there was nothing but the Bible. Again, they accepted the Bible. They believed in the Bible. But they thought to understand God's revelation in this world, you need to really open your mind. And, you know, they developed something called natural theology, which means that basically an effect teaches you about the cause. That's how we do, you know, medical research. You start with the effect, which is, say, a disease, and you try to reverse the time arrow, the, 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 the arrow of causality. You try to reverse it and go back and, and see what caused this disease. Same thing you do if you're a historian. You start with an effect or a result, say, World War II. Why did that happen? And so, again, you start with the effect. You work your way back to the cause. Same thing with a fender bender. Right? They come out, of course, in the LA freeways, you gotta move the car. But let's say in a normal city where you leave the cars where they are when you have a fender bender, they start with the effect. Cars in certain positions, skid marks, uh, you know, damages of the cars, and then they, they reason their, their way back or try to the cause. So the idea is that we have this huge effect, which is the universe. And we try to reason our way back to the cause, which same thing modern science does. That's what modern, you know, astrophysics, cosmology does. They just have a different set of assumptions. It's like in geometry. If, if different things are given, you prove different things. But they had the same idea that the universe is a huge effect. So if you study the creation, you understand the creator. And they had a very, they had a very interesting view, which I want to, and then I want to get actually to Krishna and all that, but I want to side, kind of set a, a little background here that um, there was a Logos philosophy back in the Greco-Roman period. This was pagan philosophy. I, I actually like pagans. But anyway, the Greek word Logos, obviously from which we get words like logic, there's a reason why you have geology, the Logos of geos, the Logos of the earth, why you have physiology, the logos of the physical or the body, and you have, um, you know, all the ologies. The only one that kind of misfired was astrology. And astronomers are still actually unhappy about that, that they got the ology word, the astrologers. Anyway, so the logos meant the logic of something. And there was this very popular philosophy among educated people back in the ancient world that ultimately God among other things, is a, is a supremely rational, conscious being. Not just vengeful, not just mystical, but, but God possesses infinite reason. And therefore, the universe is a logical creation. As we know, in the late Renaissance, there was a very interesting scientist that totally bought into this idea. His name was Sir Isaac Newton. And therefore, he thought the more we show the logic of the universe, the more we're showing that there is reason behind it. There's intelligence behind it because it's rational. It's law. It's a lawful universe. And so that logos is in the mind of God. The divine reason is in the mind of God. And because we are creations, we also have that logos within us. That's why we can have all these different departments called ologies because we have that logos within us and the logos is also in nature. And so when we study the world, and this is by the way, how they gave these names like physiology and geology and biology, 
bios greek means life so so the logic of life is biology and the reason they put ology is because you're connecting the logos within you this divine reason in you is connecting to the logic the reason of the universe and the reason you can do this is because ultimately there's an infinite rational mind and so people in classical civilization thought this is really cool and that's the way a lot of people were thinking so you get the renaissance which is trying because people realize at a certain point in europe what the heck are we doing in these like living like this i mean there used to be this incredible civilization they had architecture which is still not surpassed i mean classical architecture is just like you know you may do something different you're not going to do something better so and, and who was it i think was it bertrand russell said that the whole history of western philosophy is just a series of footnotes on plato so you know whether it's architecture philosophy these people were really very bright and so in Europe, at a certain point, they thought, hey, right here where we live, there was this very powerful and fantastic civilization. Let, let's try to revive it. And that's the Renaissance. Then there's a Northern European backlash against this, because if you're living in Germany somewhere, you don't identify with old Italian culture or old Greek culture. And and so there was a backlash against the Renaissance and, and an attempt to actually stop the Renaissance and push it back, get rid of all this pagan culture. And that backlash was the Protestant Reformation. Anyway, that, that's a whole story because there, there's this popular idea that the whole Reformation was just in response to church corruption. That was the trigger. That's not what drove it. The church started cleaning up because they saw, wow, we're losing countries. So that was the trigger, but what really happened, it was, it was a backlash against the Renaissance and therefore Luther had slogans like sola fede, only faith, sola scriptura, only scripture. Why? No science, no philosophy. We don't want this pagan philosophy. We don't want this pagan science that started with Aristotle. We want just one book. So the reason I mention this is because um, if, if you know your Hegel or Marx, the historical dialectic, you have a thesis, like just thesis, just the way things are right now, the status quo. And then a thesis tends to generate its own, um, its own contradiction or its own opposing force. It's like a pendulum. If you pull a pendulum this way, that force of pulling the pendulum creates an opposite force that wants to pull the pendulum to the other extreme. Or it's just like take the Russian Revolution, just, it's just popped into my head, where you had this, um, there's that old joke where the minister runs into the czar and says, your majesty, the peasants are revolting. And the czar says, yes, aren't they? So anyway, so you had this really very top heavy thing where you had a lot of people starving and, and a very few people who were fabulously wealthy and it generated its own contradiction, which was the, of course, the Bolshevik revolution. And so, and so it's this historical pendulum effect. So because you had this, this, this uh, sort of church repression of free thought, even of science and philosophy, and, and of course intelligent people, once they got a taste of freedom, they weren't going to let go of it, and they kept pushing. And so the, you, you have the 1600s, the age of reason, scientific revolution. The 18, 18, 1700s, it really, it actually turns anti-religious. French Revolution, they killed priests, they went around killing priests. Anyway, that's the whole thing, Robespierre, poor guy, but make a long story short, the secularists, the secularists who tended to be anti-church for the simple reason that the church was the enemy who was stopping them, first of all, from getting jobs in universities. That's why they have salons in Paris and London, because they couldn't get real jobs in universities. Couldn't get jobs, they were being persecuted. I mean, in Oxford, in Oxford, England, in the center of Oxford, there's a monument to these three Protestant theologians. These were Oxford professors who were burned alive. Talk about professor abuse. They were burned alive because a Bloody Mary, a, a Catholic monarch took the throne 
and she decided to kill the Protestants, or at least kill Protestants who wouldn't just shut up and hide in their hovels. And so she, she gave them the chance, like, you can either become Catholic and teach Catholicism at Oxford, or you will burn at the stake. And at first they said, ah, eh, maybe Catholicism's not so bad. But then ultimately they made what for them was a rational calculus. They thought, if we become Catholic, we will burn forever. I mean, there's obviously something wrong with this picture. I mean, these, <laughs> I mean, we don't want to go back to those days. But they thought, if we become Catholic, we'll burn forever. Better to burn one time and then go to heaven forever. So, but, so you can see how open-minded people, thoughtful people, they saw this type of brutality, this type of fanaticism as the enemy of reason, the enemy of knowledge, the enemy of progress, which started to become a real thing with the revival of science. And so, and so long story short, they took over the universities, which they still control to this day, by the way. And then once the secularists took over the universities, Got this for you. Oh, aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you very much. So once the secularists took over the university, it was, you know, yes, payback. It was payback. And so it, you know, the university started purging themselves of religious people. And you develop, you know, in the 19th century, 20th century, you get like, you get people like Thomas Huxley saying that just as Hercules smashed all the poisonous snakes that threatened him, so the secularists, the, the agnostics, have smashed the poisonous snakes of the priests and the theologians. So theologians who used to rule Western universities were the poisonous snakes that the Herculean rationalists and scientists were smashing. I remember in the late 1960s, uh, I went to Berkeley in the late 60s and I was out in the street, you know, with all my extraordinary 19-year-old maturity. But it's interesting, then I actually joined the Hare Krishna movement in Berkeley. And, um, and uh, then I was put in charge, I was 20 years old. I, I went, and I was still a student at Berkeley, so I went to the university and I would arrange like a campus club or permission to speak. And it's interesting, at that time, in the University of California, you could have a club and give a public program on any conceivable topic, including, I suppose, Satanism or atheism, but not religion. It was the only topic on which you were legally forbidden to hold a program. And I actually told a white lie to Dean Shotwell at Sproul Hall, the administration building in Berkeley. Religion, oh, this is not religion. My God, this is anything but religion. So, and then we, we, of course, we got a campus club, but, and the Supreme Court threw that out, by the way. The Supreme Court threw that out. So there's something that scholars call the war thesis, that when the secularists took control of the universities, it was war. And religious people or, you know, whatever, they were the enemy. They would destroy civilization if given a chance. They'll bring us back to the dark ages, the war thesis. Now, it's interesting. You still see this war thesis because take, for example, intelligent design theory, the idea that if you mathematically uh, map or if you mathematically express the complexity of biological forms on Earth, in other words, just take a living body, and look at all the almost infinitely complex causalities that are going on in order for your body to live. And if you say, how could this like infinitely supercomputer come to exist? And the most philosophically likely thing is it just happened by itself. You get something which is infinitely more complex than our computers, and yet it just kind of assembled itself. The wind blew, the rain fell, and you get the ultimate supercomputer. That sounds right. But what's interesting is that the U.S. courts, in their glorious ignorance, threw out intelligent design as a religious theory, which it's not, it's a philosophical view. If you say, let's say, Jesus created the world, or Yahweh created the world, or if you say Krishna created the world, yeah, 
that's a religious view which should not be taught in public schools because it's a religious view. If you say that, uh, but if you say design theory, that is a philosophical position which predates Christianity. It's a philosophical position. It, you're saying that the most logical explanation for almost infinite complexity is intelligence. Like if, for example, that piano there, if I say somebody probably built that piano, I can't prove it. Maybe that piano is a result of just natural forces. But if I say, no, I think someone built the piano, that's not religious, that's logic. And so the fact that a rational view, which is actually mathematically more probable, namely design, is rejected by the courts as religion is part of the same paranoia. That if you let anything that even smacks of metaphysics into the educational system, right back to the dark ages. Now, the point I wanted to make, I originally said, and I, I want to say it quickly before everybody you know, wants their money back because I didn't say what I said I was going to say. Um, the Scottish philosopher Hume, anyway, I, I won't go into all the details, but let's talk about the DOI, Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson gives a metaphysical argument. Okay, here, first let me go into the proofs. I, I want to give you some logical proofs that you live in your real life in a bi-dimensional universe and that you do not live and would never want to live in an absolutely empirical universe. Take, for example, the American political system. Well, it's actually plutocracy, rule of the rich, but let's say it's theoretically democracy and so on. Now, democracy is based on equality. Now, equality is empirically meaningless. For example, I just looked up before I came here, the, the admission rate for USC undergraduate uh, a year or two ago was like 17.7%. That's extremely selective. And it's probably lower now. So, and you get the, some of the, like, the Harvard's that they're getting down to single digits now. And if you look at graduate programs at USC or elsewhere, some of the graduate programs are even much more selective. So equality, we're not equal empirically. I mean, for example, you obviously can't run as fast as I can. It's a joke. I mean, if, if you look at us athletically, artistically, mathematically, philosophically, engineeringly, if you look at emotional IQ, which is a, a big deal, emotional IQ, if you look at all the different kinds of intelligence, in none of them, there's no conceivable test that you could give humanity and find out that we're all equal. There's no conceivable way you could, you could test everyone. Like, it's just, it's just not. And yet, we believe, as I think, most of us or all of us believe that there is a very profound sense in which we're equal. All of us. It doesn't matter what kind of body you have. And it is so profound that it is not the empirical fact that we're different, but it is the metaphysical fact of equality. Equality is 100%, 1,000%. Sounds like a car salesman. Equality is 100% a metaphysical idea. It has no physical basis. It is metaphysical. And yet we have chosen to base our political system, our justice system, our educational, you know, public educational system, not on empirical facts, but on metaphysical facts. Namely that we're equal. Democracy. I saw this bumper sticker, Ohio University is really good. It said, um, this is back during the Iraq war and all that. It said, if you don't accept them, no, they want to say, if you don't, if you don't cooperate with America, we are going to bring democracy to your country. It's like a threat. <laughs> Anyways, if you know some of the results of America's uh, nation building projects. So, but the idea is our entire political injustice system is based on metaphysics. Now, Thomas Jefferson, who was no dummy, I mean, he was not morally perfect, as we now know, but philosophically, he was no dummy. And 
that's why he started the DOI the way he did. I mean, just look at the first line of the Declaration of Independence, which is a very powerful philosophical statement. And, you, and to understand what he's saying, you have to know something about Western philosophy. So he starts out by saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident is a technical philosophical term introduced by Aristotle in the West and also used in the East in some very sophisticated Eastern philosophies. Self-evident, I mean, declaring something to be self-evident. Jefferson knew what he was doing. That's how you escape an infinite regress of proofs. Because if I say water boils at 100 degrees Celsius and you say, prove it. And so I get a pot of water, put it on the stove, thermometer, turn on the heat and look, 100 degrees, it boiled, pay me. Now you could say, well, no, I don't believe that's pure water. Or I don't believe that's pure mercury in the thermometer. So you've got to test the water. But then you can say, well, I don't believe those are pure water testing chemicals. In other words, you can be pushed back into an infinite regress of proofs because no matter what anyone demonstrates, you can say, well, prove that. Aristotle said, this isn't going to work because if we go on in this way, we can never certainly know anything. And so how do you get out of an infinite regress of proofs? And just very quickly, I don't want to throw too much technical stuff on you. Um, he came up with an epistemology philosophy, like how do you know you know, called foundationalism, which means that the foundation of knowledge is something which is self-evident. It proves itself, and therefore you can't be pushed into a regress of proofs. I'll give you an example of, of, of the uh, epistemological foundationalism, empirical science. Someone could say, do you really believe, are you so naive? that you believe there's a real physical world outside your mind. I mean, seriously? It's just all in your mind and, and you can't prove it. It would be circular reasoning. I don't want to go into all the technical logic, but if I say, for example, of course there's a real world, like this is my very sophisticated, I got my first smartphone about 10, 10 months ago. My, my friends were threatening an intervention. They were taking my flip phone away, but anyway, <laughs> So I could say that, okay, I can prove there's a real physical world. This is a real cell phone. You can touch it. But that's circular because this is a real cell phone only if the whole physical world is real. If the whole world is an illusion, that includes the phone. So it's circular reasoning. So empirically, you can't prove empiricism because you fall immediately into an egregious, shameless case of circular reasoning. So therefore, in order to start the empirical enterprise, you must declare, if you were a philosopher, you must declare that the reality of a world outside my mind is self-evident, it proves itself. If you are, in the relevant sense, healthy, if, you, if your senses are working properly, if your mind is working properly, doesn't mean you're a genius, but you're just roughly sane, you know, roughly same, it's kind of, that kind of describes me when I was an undergraduate, roughly same. But, so if you are, you know, roughly sane, then the world presents itself to your senses and to your mind in such a way that it proves itself. The quality of your experience of the world outside your mind is so powerful and so real that you cannot reasonably doubt it. So therefore, your experience of the world becomes the foundation of your science. You can't prove there's a real world out there. You can't because you have to prove it empirically. And, and therefore you get like these really hilarious comical things like they don't require, people that get PhDs in science don't have to take epistemology courses and God does it show. So for example, you get these claims like that, um, Nothing can be accepted as an objective fact unless it's empirically demonstrated. This, of course, philosophers rejected this almost 100 years ago because it's so stupid. And the stupid part of this is that you can't empirically prove that things have to be empirically verified. So if it's true that you have to empirically verify things, if it's true, it's not true because the claim that you have to empirically verify things can't be empirically verified. It would involve radical circularity. So 
But what I'm saying is, now look at the metaphysical part of the universe. If you believe, in fact, if, if, you, if, if you would claim that you know that it is wrong to torture and kill children. I mean, I know that that's true, that that's evil. If you go with the purely physicalist philosophy, what you, what ultimately you have to say is that no, it's not really wrong to torture and kill children. It's just that evolution neurologically programmed us to believe a fairy tale because gene pools that believe that it's wrong to torture and kill children did better than gene pools that didn't believe that. And since there's nothing real except matter, and even consciousness is just kind of like a little, I don't know, physical burp or something, it's an epiphenomenon of matter. Therefore, and since values like right and wrong, like it's wrong to oppress innocent people, it's right to treat people fairly, those are values. Those are met justice as metaphysical. There's no physical object. You know, bring me three blue justices and, and two vanilla justices or something. There's no physical thing which is a justice. It's a value. Values are metaphysical. So if you really believe, if you think you know that anything, anything at all in the world is wrong and anything is right, you live in a bi-dimensional universe in which there are real things that are not empirical like justice, like equality. These are real things, but they're not physical. I'll give you another example of how you can prove to yourself a little thought experiment, and prices are slashed today. Anyway, for example, all of this example comes from the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the good book. In the, <laughs> I'm a Gita thumper, anyway. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives this example, which in Sanskrit is Dehi no sminjata dehi komarang jovana. Anyway, just as in this body, in your present body, whatever kind of body you have, you have experienced, uh, Krishna says komaram, which means childhood, jovanam, from which uh, adolescence, and jara, well, old age. Uh, anyway, when you get there, tell me what it's like. So, so just like in this body, we experience childhood or even infancy i actually have infant memories precocious anyway when we were very young and so now the body you have now and basically everyone here is an adult it's not that your baby body stretched into your present body that's not what happened that's not what happened what happened is that you are constantly replacing your body. I know when I was at Harvard, I once got poison oak or ivy or something, my own fault. And so I know because it took two weeks before I wasn't in agony because that's how long it took for the skin to be, to replace itself. It actually, the poison ivy or whatever it was, uh, I, I made a, an attempt to be a gardener. That was my last attempt to be a gardener. Anyway, so it, it actually, binds itself to your skin and, and literally you have to replace the skin or take antibiotics. I nuked it, I have to admit, I nuked it. But, but the point here is, let's say you are sexually attracted to someone and you embrace them and then they go away for two weeks and you see them again. The body, it's actually, you're actually embracing a different skin. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I'm not saying you shouldn't embrace that person. I'm not trying to rain on your, you know, your parade, but it's like that old German thing, Spieglein, Spieglein an der Wand. Did you hear no German? That's the original from Grimm's Fairy Tales, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. In German, it's Spieglein, Spieglein an der Wand, Ferris, Schoenst im ganzen Land. Anyway, who's the fairest of, the, of them all? So when you do the Mirror, Mirror thing, Mirror, mirror on the wall, you know, because every, you know, everyone does that, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, you are. So if you look in the mirror now and look in two weeks, it's actually a different face. The pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus is famous for having said or that you can't step in the same river twice. There's just a little footnote I can't resist. Look at Heraclitus and Empedocles, these pre-Socratic philosophers, they were teaching basically the same thing as Buddha. 
and the Jain, the, the, the Jina who founded Jainism, th there was this thing sweeping the world about the temporary nature of the world. It's all temporary. Everything is processed. There are no fixed states of things. So th that was one of the basic claims of Buddhism. Anyway, it was also going on in Europe. So Heraclitus said that you can't step in the same river twice. My version of that is you can't breathe in the same body twice. You literally cannot breathe twice in the same body. Because it's constantly changing. And yet, you are the same person. I mean, let's do a little linguistic anthropology here. I mean, we say, I was, you know, when I was a cute little baby, my mother thinks I was a cute baby. I look at pictures and think, oh my God. But, <laughs> but she thought I was cute. I, I've never figured out why she thought that thing was cute. But anyway, <laughs> so, you know, we know that I was a little child. I was, a, what do they call it, a tween? I was a teenager or whatever. But these are all different bodies. Your body didn't stretch. They're different bodies. And so you have already reincarnated, you know, Latin carne, flesh. Uh, reincarnation con carne. It's, it's like we have literally, reincarnation just means reinfleshing. That's, you know, that's just what it means. And so we have reincarnated, just divide your age by seven approximately. That's how many times you've reincarnated. That was a wrong accent. That was like not native English. Reincarnated. Okay. You know, divide your age by seven, and that's how many times you've reincarnated in this life. So if you ask the question, is there reincarnation? You've already done it. If you're over seven, you've already done it. And so the real question is, does it continue? But be that as it may, the, the fact that the real you, your deepest inner core self, the real you, you know, not when, not when I'm trying to show off to somebody or not when I'm bewildered, who am I, blah, blah, blah. You know, when I'm really in touch with my real self, it's not physical. It's not your arm, it's not your legs, not your head. So even your deepest sense of self is um, not material. And we're talking psychology now, not theology. And so if you look at your own deepest sense of self, if you look at your values, because every value is metaphysical, if you look at every English sentence, which is not a grammatically conditional, I'll explain that. If you look at every English sentence, which is not grammatically conditional, which contains the auxiliary verb should or must, that's a metaphysical claim. Like by conditional sense, I mean, for example, if I say, if you want to get to Arizona uh, before midnight, you must fly there. You know, you can't drive. You're not going to get to Arizona by midnight. So I'm using the word must or should, but it's conditional. It's like, if you want that, you need to do that. But let's try the same auxiliary verb in an unconditional sentence, like, you should treat people equally. You should not be a racist. It's not like, if you want a good life, you should not be a racist. We're simply saying you shouldn't be a racist. It's, it's unconditional. You just shouldn't do that. Or you should be fair to people. So when you grammatically, when you use the verb should or must in an unconditional sentence, you are making a metaphysical claim. And if you're speaking sincerely, if you really mean it, you believe that there are all kinds of real things in the universe that are not empirical and they're not physical. And you live in a bi-dimensional universe. And so, which is, by the way, the real world. So just as we have an empirical science or physical science, you know, the, the 800 pound overweight Hare Krishna in the room. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Silly joke. Anyway, the, uh, the obvious point is just, <laughs> If you belong to a religious institution, you'd better laugh a lot. Anyway, so just like we have a physical science <laughs> or an empirical science, where's the metaphysical science? How can you be a rational human being if the universe is bi-dimensional 
and the metaphysical dimension is what is most important to you. People give their lives for love, for their families. I was very blessed. I had really loving parents for which I'll be grateful for the rest of my life. And I knew that my parents would give their lives for me if it came down to that. I mean, certainly didn't want it to come to that. I mean, we have freedom of speech here. I can actually sit here and talk all this pagan stuff because some people in America gave their lives so that I could speak something which probably they religiously didn't agree with. And so people give their lives for love, for their families, for, for, for their ideals, for justice, and, and so on and so forth. And our political system, our judicial system is based on metaphysical principles. So where the rubber meets the road, as they say, ultimately in this bi-dimensional bi universe, we give pride of place to the metaphysical. That's what makes life meaningful. And therefore, not to have a science for the most important part of life and to only have a science for the mechanistic part of life is obviously a cultural problem. And that may explain why um, our society is so because we have nothing like a metaphysical science. We have nothing like a spirit. If we have one though, you're, you're not allowed to say that. But so what I'm proposing to you is that we complete the Renaissance. Because English, of course, is a Germanic language, as you know, and German is very intimately connected to Sanskrit. So there is an, an ancient Indo-European civilization. I don't wanna go into all the fascinating technical grammatical details of ancient Greek and, and Latin, but suffice it to say, and I know you'll be very disappointed that I'm not going to do that, but suffice it to say that Sanskrit, the ancient language of India, is intimately, I mean, at a morphological, structural level, it, it's very much connected to English. For just a few examples, in Sanskrit, I'll give you two examples, one uh, lexical and, and one structural, I mean, in linguistics. The words sound the same. To say brother in Sanskrit is brater. To say mother, mater and so on, there's lots of words like that. Here's this, or like for example, take the, the, the English uh, verb stem, vert, to which you add prefixes like invert, revert, pervert, subvert, extrovert, and, and so you have this, English has a structure where you take a basic stem, vert stem, vert, word stem, <laughs> vert, st <laughs> word stem, vert, and you, you get all these different semantic choices by putting prefixes on them invert, revert, pervert, subvert, and so on. And vert means to turn. So vert is Sanskrit. And it means the same thing, to turn. So, in, and you put prefixes, you have the same structure. So you could say pravart, or uh, abivart, or this vart, or that vart. So the structure of the language, the vocabulary. And the reason I mention this is because the Renaissance was ultimately a rebirth of Indo-European civilization. I don't mean Hinduism, and I don't mean this or that. I'm talking about something older, an older layer. So the Renaissance, because you can't revive Greco-Roman civilization without also reviving the ancient Sanskritic, Vedic civilization, because if you go back far enough, you know, past the, say, the historical horizon into proto-history, uh, there is an Indo-European civilization, which is not controversial in academia, by the way on linguistic evidence. So in bringing you all this Sanskritic knowledge and Bhagavad Gita, it's actually part of the Renaissance project. We're actually, I mean, as Western people, we're trying to re get back to our own, you could say, well, this is kind of getting a little sectarian, but an original culture. So this, the culture of Krishna, Bhagavad Gita of Sanskrit is, is part of our cultural DNA in the West and other parts of the world too, because I mean, there's a reason why all these geographic names, place names in Southeast Asia are Sanskrit, like Singapore, for example, which is pure Sanskrit. Singapore means lion city. Pura is city in Sanskrit. And from Pura, you get the Greek word polis and political and cosmopolitan, police and all that. That's Sanskrit Pura, Singapore, lion city. Or Sumatra, the biggest island in the 
in Indonesian, the Indonesian archipelago, is Sumatra, which in Sanskrit means very big. Or you get the ancient name of Thailand, which is Siam, an old name of Krishna, Siam, and so on. There's a reason why in, in, in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, in the, in the center of the town, center of the country, there's a big statue of Krishna and Arjuna on the chariot, which is the Bhagavad Gita scene. And why the Indonesian Airlines is called uh, Garuda Airlines. Garuda is this great eagle that carries Vishnu. Or why, for example, the, perhaps the biggest, most magnificent Vishnu temple, Vishnu is Krishna, the, perhaps the most magnificent Vishnu temple in the world is in Cambodia and it's called Angkor Wat. There's a reason why they found seals of the meditating Shiva in Denmark. So, I mean, that's a whole other topic. I mean, what the world used to be like and what the Indo-European civilization was and what its cultural extension was and so on. But, so, anyway, sorry for all that. That means a lot of information and you will not be tested. <laughs> but, uh, so in my own approach to this whole Krishna consciousness, Hare Krishna thing, is because my own nature, as you may have guessed by now, is somewhat on the rational side. And I was not looking for a religion because I already had one. My parents had one. So I, I was definitely not looking for a religion. I was not looking for friends, like a warm, fuzzy community because I'm kind of lonely. No, I actually had lots of friends. I was, I was very fortunate, too. A lot of my friends from L.A., Hammy High, they went to Berkeley with me. So I had a lot of friends, I had a good family, but I was actually looking for a spiritual science. So uh, thank you all for participating and uh, just encourage you to participate more. It, it's, it's incredible. And we're not using you as guinea pigs, by the way, because this has been done for thousands of years. These are the people that brought you yoga. Yoga is a Sanskrit word. And, and um, it, it all comes from this great civilization. Any questions on all these points? <laughs> Too much information, TMI. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here. That's a really beautiful part. Definitely diving into metaphysical science, like you mentioned, incorporating it into this Western world. How would a metaphysical science approach look like moving forward? Very good question. Very good question. Which. Uh, you shouldn't have asked it. That's too good. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Okay, let me put. Let me give you a, a short list of items or characteristics that you would expect to find in any science, physical or metaphysical. One thing would be, for example, um, internal coherence. That a teaching doesn't. And of course, this is just the beginning. This is not like the end of it, but it doesn't contradict itself. That's why the whole particle wave thing is so, you know, that's why scientists start buying more aspirin after they discover that because, I mean, the whole idea is that any system of knowledge should not contradict itself. You can have a paradox and they assume it's a paradox. Paradox means an apparent contradiction which can be resolved upon further, you know, deeper understanding. So it shouldn't, like, for example, you can't say God is infinitely merciful and God tortures his own children forever if they make relatively subtle theological mistakes. So there shouldn't be internal contradiction. And the explanatory power, just like in a scientific theory, you want to see what's the explan or, or in a theory in the humanities. How much explanatory power does it have? How big is the theory and how much does it explain? So, for example, we are personal. I remember, God, this is so before your time, but I remember back in the 60s, back, back in the late 60s when, you know, people in my generation were learning all the values and ideas that would later ruin the lives of their children, but that's a joke. But anyway, so back in the late 60s, when the world was really becoming mechanized, much there was like a real leap toward mechanization and, 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 the, and the early computers, and there was this reaction against it. And so there was this slogan among young people, your age at, at, at Berkeley and other universities, that don't fold, spindle, or mutilate, because you get these in those days, this is very ancient. We actually had these computer cards. They'd have like holes in them. Trust me, we really had things like that. And 
And of course, if you if you folded the card, it wouldn't go into the computer, into the unit back. It wouldn't go into the computer. And so it would say in the card, don't fold, spindle, or mutilate me. And students start to feel like cogs in a machine as the world really started to get, you know, technology and mech and mech. And, and so th there was a thing like, I'm not a computer card. I'm a real living student. Don't just treat me like, you know, computer. Don't fold, spindle, or mutilate me. And so, so the reason I bring that up is because Ultimately, whether we articulate it consciously or not, we see people as more evolved, the more personal they are. If someone is sensitive to you, to your needs, understands you, or at least tries to understand you in, in, a, in a reasonable way, or and someone else, no, just treats you like some mechanical thing, like get out of the way, you're just an obstacle in my path, or you are a sex object, or you are a sale I could make, like, hey, have I got a deal for you? Like, I couldn't care less if you go to hell tomorrow, but buy this from me today. So when people treat you like a thing, either for their own financial gain, for their sexual pleasure, for whatever, we become disgusted, basically. And we want to be treated like persons, because that's what we are. We're persons. And to be a person means you have free will. It means you have feelings. It means you, you have creativity. I mean, it's much better than not being a person. There are spiritual paths that try to persuade you to commit spiritual or philosophical suicide, like being a person is a problem. And so go into this meditation, sort of divest yourself of personhood and so what I say is suicide is not healthy, whether it's physical or philosophical. You are a person. The fact that you are a, an, a unique, even if there's trillions of souls in the universe, not one other soul is exactly like you. And so you are absolutely unique and relevantly similar. So you can actually talk to other people and have relationships. So you are completely unique and you and, and there's there's really no limit to the amount of internal and external beauty of which you are capable if you evolve as a soul. You can make free choices. You can choose to love. You can choose to accept the love of others. You can create in, in so many ways. I and mean, why would you want to give that up to become like sort of part of this impersonal corporate bright light or something, you know? So. So the best thing that ever happened to us is that we're persons. We have free will. And so if you, if you take yourself seriously, if you're not so cynical or discouraged about whatever troubles you have in life, you're giving up on the greatest thing you could ever have to be a unique person, conscious person, if you, st you, know, if you still want to go with that, then clearly the source of your existence must be somehow personal. Because if there was some kind of divine ultimate truth which was impersonal, how could there be a world? I mean, how could God create the world? And whoops, I didn't really mean to do that. And kind of, uh, oh, Portuguese, pues sin querer. And so, <laughs> whoops, you know, how could, an, why would an impersonal existence create personal things? It's like, because if you're impersonal, you don't have desires, people desire. So, you, so the absolute truth wouldn't want to create, why would it create? And if there's ultimately one, how, where, where, does, where does the multiplicity come from? I mean, if, if there's just one reality, how does it become bewildered? How does it become stupid? How does it have to, you know, oops, I better go to buy a book on, you know, how to become enlightened or something. So we're persons. And, and, and we'll always be persons, and, and you can become an, an unlimited person. The present body we have is just a body. It's just one body, but so the cause must explain the, the effect. Okay, I'm sorry, getting back to your point. I didn't forget you, I just... So, um, explanatory power. If you think that the ultimate truth is impersonal, however you configure that, however you conceive it, if you think that ultimately, ultimately, there's an impersonal source, you cannot explain your present existence. You cannot explain, you cannot begin to explain what is most important in your life and the lives of everyone you know, that we're persons. 
and we're conscious. And so the explanatory power of any type of ultimate impersonal truth is abysmal. So explanatory power, internal consistency, and if we assume, as I suggest we do, that the ultimate truth is good, because like Descartes said, you know, what if the ultimate highest truth, what if there is a God, but he's a complete a-hole? Actually, there was a philosophy like that. Uh, it, was, it was called Manichaeism. Oh, God, should I say it? Okay, very quickly. This explains a lot of the dark side of medieval Christian theology, because the main architect of medieval Christian theology was uh, St. Augustine. And for, he was very bright. He's, I mean, no one doubts that he, you know, he would get super SAT scores. But for 10 years before he came back to the religion of his mother, Santa Monica, that's Santa Monica, that's the mother of Augustine. See that without Augustine, you wouldn't have Santa Monica. And so for 10 years as an adult, as a very, very bright adult, he was a Manichaean. The Manichaeans believed, they, they, they asked the question, why is there so much evil in the world? Why is there so much suffering? If there's a God, why is, it, why is there so much bad stuff in this world if there's a God? You know, it's the old perennial questions called theodicy in Western philosophy, the problem of evil. So money, this Persian prophet or wannabe prophet who died an unnatural death, which you'll understand when you see what his philosophy was, why he couldn't expect to live very long in the ancient world with this kind of idea. He said the reason the world is, there's so much evil, is because the world was created by God and God is the devil. And he was, he was, he meant the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Old Testament embraced by Jesus and the followers of Jesus. That's why there's evil in the world, because the creator, God, is evil. And because our bodies are created by that evil, that devil of a God, our bodies are evil. Ding, ding, ding. And so this very dark picture of the world and this dark picture of yourself and your own body, which by the way, and so when Augustine came back to the Christian world and became one of its most important, perhaps its most important intellectual leader, you know, he brought a little bit of this shade with him. And by the way, he was picked up by Calvin centuries later, and Calvinism spread to Scotland. From Scotland, it came down to England, and from England, it went over on the Mayflower, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And if you look at the sermons of people like Jonathan Edwards, the most famous preacher in colonial, you know, in, in New England, Oh my God. It's like, if you look at the sermons from back then, he went to Yale, by the way. So it's, it's like, you are so repulsive. You are so disgusting. God loathes you. He despises you. And there's nothing you could ever do to be righteous in the sight of God. You are an absolute loser. And therefore, anyway, that's why they start infant baptism because Christian uh, baptism used to be exactly like yoga initiation, like in the Hare Krishna movement, like in like all the yoga, you have this diksha, this initiation, where you have to agree, take a vow. That's where the word devotee comes from, devoto, Latin. Voto means a vow. So when you agree to live by a religious vow, you become a devotee. So Christian baptism before Augustine used to be like yoga initiation you had to agree to like you know you would like no fornication no sex outside of marriage and you're not going to smoke or drink or you know pay astrologers to do your horoscope anyway so that's a thing but so that's why uh, uh what's his uh constantine who, who kind of legitimized and spread christianity in the roman empire he never got baptized till his deathbed because he said hey i'm an emperor i do all kinds of bad things you know like i lots of women kill lots of people and i can't take the vow so there was a debate in the christian world and augustine comes down on the side of infant baptism i mean obviously 
if you understand baptism to mean that you choose as an adult, you choose to accept a particular doctrine, you choose to believe in something, I mean, obviously a baby can't do that. But Augustine brings his Manichaean darkness into the whole picture where we are so evil, we are so dark, we are so hopeless, we can't help ourselves. Therefore, sure, baptize the baby. Because even as an adult, he's not gonna be able to do anything for himself. It's all God's mercy. So, so rather than being a reciprocation where you make an effort, you practice a spiritual path, whether it's early Christianity, whether it's bhakti yoga, whether, you know, whatever it is, you practice some path and God reciprocates. Like any good parent, right? Like, you know, good mother, good father, you try and I'll help you. You know, I want to see that you're trying. I'm not going to spoil you. You make an effort, I'll help. That's basically, you know, that's God. So, Anyway, so I would say that you have to check a, 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 a spiritual philosophy. Someone claims this is God, not because it's not a question of, okay, Christianity is true and, and Hinduism is false or Buddhism is true or this or that. It's not, it's not like that. You have to look philosophically, philosophically and say, Does this, is this reasonable? Is this reasonable? And, and, is God evil or is God good? So if you believe God is good, then it must be the case that the more God conscious you are, the better, the more virtuous you are. And if the more someone gets into their religion, the more murderous they become, the more hateful they become, there is something seriously wrong with the picture. So, so that's sort of like a behavioral definition. Someone who becomes more hateful, uh, against people that don't believe what they believe, they're not on the right track. You should become more virtuous. You should become more virtuous, more, you know, kinder, more open, more generous, see the good in everyone. So there are behavioral symptoms, there are philosophical requirements, and, you know, what's actually happening in your life? Is your consciousness expanding? And, and, and are you getting self-validating, or I would say, uh, you know, uh, the, the technical philosophical term is properly basic. Experiences in, in foundationalism, the idea is like your experience of this world, that there's a real world outside my mind. That is properly basic in the sense the experience is so powerful that it, it is proper, it, it, it works as the basis for your knowledge system. So those are just a few ideas, but... Thank you all for your patience. It was really great to be able to spend a little time with all you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I got to say goodbye to everyone around the world on Facebook. Oh, there you go. Hey, uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>